الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الناصمين المظلومين ولعنة الله على دعهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, I thank you once more for joining us live from the holy city of Karbala for this episode of the show Back to the Basics in which I, your host, Yahya Seymour, shall inshallah ta'ala be discussing some of the things we had mentioned in the previous episode. For those of you who did not have the pleasure of joining us for the previous two episodes rather, I shall just recount some of the things that we had brought up. The whole concept of Back to Basics or Back to the Basics rather was something conceptualized by the management of this blessed and humble channel, Imam Hussein TV, in which it was suggested to me that there be a show responding to some of the claims, some of the engagements with Shiism, or as we would say, original Islam, and these claims and how these claims impact upon us, and how to respond to them. Because, of course, it is without doubt that some of the claims against Shiism and particularly due to the way they're brought out to the forelight. Things are done, activities are done, debates are had, discussions might be had on Facebook. These debates can cause doubts, and particularly in the generation in which we've traditionally failed to equip our youth with the right answers and the right solutions for how to deal with such problems. Unfortunately, I find that many of the ways that we as a community have been dealing with these doubts, it becomes indicative of a real and bigger problem that we have and that we've all been facing. Namely, we're very reactionary. We're people that like to respond to things when things happen. And as a result, we tend to only respond to challenges when they come and hit us. We don't have a tendency to equip our youth with how to think outside of the role of these challenges. And so, the responses become very much at the beck and call of the one that challenges Shiism. And what I mean by this is that we become a people who define our theology in light of what others say. Something extremely dangerous to do. And that was the whole intention behind this show, Back to the Basics, is to bring everything literally, as the name states, back to the basics, where we discuss the ways in which, inshallah ta'ala, we can respond to these challenges appropriately, adequately, and in a way which does not make us reactionary, but inshallah ta'ala is a bit more loyal to human rationality and indeed to the tradition of the original Islam as was brought by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and protected by his purified holy household and progeny. One of the things I had stated particularly in the first and second episodes is that one of the key problems to this reactionary approach is that instead of dancing to the call of someone else, we should really be as two people engaging in a dialogue, setting down the rules of a dialogue ourselves, and basically agreeing to what the rules of such a dialogue are, what the evidence is entailed are, and what is considered to be suitable evidence. If you watch many of these discussions as they take place, you read many of the discussions on Facebook, it literally becomes a case of what I like to call personal pontification. That is to say that each person becomes the individual judge of the discussion, and unfortunately we get nowhere. So if you were to discuss with a Christian who would tell you that the only thing I believe to be true is the Bible, and I don't care what anything else says because the Bible's true, and when you would try and challenge the very foundations of the Bible, he would say to you, well, look, this is what I believe. I want proof from the Bible. You would never try to engage with him on that basis where you would literally bring an entire theology, an entire school, an entire worldview, namely original Islam or Shiism, out of the Bible alone. No, you might be able to bring out one or two references to certain key concepts. And even that is a failed project because the entire book is filled with corruption it's something that's been distorted. And yes, whilst there are original kernels of truth in the book, from the Islamic perspective at least, we would say that we do not take the entire book to be trustworthy and sound. Likewise, the approach goes back to those who have discussions 
with those who call themselves the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. If we're to say that, look, I want you to prove the doctrine of Imamat from the Quran and the authentic hadith, and then you're restricted to the authentic hadith as being a hadith in the Sahihain, namely Bukhari and Muslim, is such an approach going to work? No. Because even if you were to find authentic hadith in the Sahihain, then you would still come across a plethora of evidence in those books which supports the madhab of a person that believes in those books. Because at the end of the day, the compiler was Sunni, and the whole book was put together in a milieu and a community that believed in Sunnism. So for you to find Shiism in that book, and to expect to only find Shiism in that book, and Shiism in its most perfect and complete form as the true original Islam, is a fallacious belief. That's not going to happen. So before we have any dialogue, as I mentioned before, we need to sit down, discuss terms, go back to the basics, and discuss what is evidence and what is the approach we take. So I'm proposing over these next few nights, inshallah ta'ala, that instead of being reactionary, instead of wanting to justify every single isolated belief we have, instead of trying to prove our beliefs from an evidential, let's build up from belief one to belief five type of approach, where I have to therefore justify everything from the fact that I pray with my arms down by my side, to the fact that I pray on a turba, to the fact that I choose to face the holy city of Mecca to a Christian. Let's look at, instead of isolated beliefs, let's look at everything as packages of beliefs, worldviews, things which, when we compare to one another, how do they line up? And this is the approach which I'm suggesting tonight, inshallah ta'ala. I believe this approach is quite consistent with the approach of the holy Ahlul Bayt, alayhi before I move further into this approach, allow me to give an analogy from the perspective of simplicity. An analogy which I hope you'll keep all in your minds, and an analogy which I'm hoping will become made clear by the end of the episode. That is to say, you might not understand the analogy right now if I give it to you. We've all lived in major Western cities, I would hope, and for those of us who speak English, we've watched enough movies to know what life is like in major western cities but every now and, and then I'm always surprised when it happens that you're going down the tube or the subway or you're going down a busy part of say New York or London and a homeless person who's clearly high on drugs or alcohol comes out and tries to convince you that everything is just a global conspiracy that everyone's in a giant matrix or delusion and that something really is happening behind the scenes and they're the only ones that have got it right. And I literally mean them as an individual. When we meet such people, we normally have certain thoughts about such a person in our minds. I certainly know that I struggle to take any person that believes that reality other than their own self-perception cannot be trusted. And therefore, I don't trust what such people have to say. Keep that analogy in your minds, inshallah ta'ala, we'll come back to it by the end of the project. So looking at the concept of aqidah as a worldview, as opposed to individual separate doctrines, looking at things as a complete package, we need to ask ourselves, what is a belief system or a worldview? So that's the first question we have. What is a belief system or what is a worldview? And I don't want to use tautologies like saying it's a view of the world or it's a system of beliefs, because that's very clear from the names but rather, what do we mean by a system of belief or a view of the world? What we mean by this is a network of interconnected beliefs and assumptions about man, life, and the universe, their origin, their purpose, and future, which shapes how we view and understand our experiences and surroundings in addition to our behavior. So I'll repeat that again. A worldview is an interconnected system and set of beliefs which pertains to man, life, and the universe. It pertains to our role within the universe, what our future will be, how we connect with our past, and how we understand our experiences. This is the definition of a worldview. Everyone has a worldview because they couldn't function without one. But the problem is most people don't actually understand what their worldview is. A lot of the time, even Muslims included, we allow society and the dominant worldview of society to dominate how we actually shape our beliefs and how we interpret the data in front of us. So allow me to give an, an example and quite a 
key example, inshallah ta'ala, in Western liberal society, we'll generally take the worldview of Western liberalism as our dominant governing worldview. That is to say, whilst we might profess a belief in Islam, deep down we're shaped and affected by the dominant beliefs of Western liberalism. So one of those beliefs might be, for example, the right for somebody to engage in a marital relationship with someone of the same gender. Whilst we know that Islam is clearly against this, you'll find that some Muslims will say, well, yeah, that's how I view things and that's how Islam views things, but you know, I don't want to judge this particular action. And that's as a result of Western liberalism where they've been influenced to a degree that they don't want to take a clear-cut stance on these issues. They cannot admit that you know, the Ahlul Bayt have a clear-cut stance. Or another particular consequence of Western liberalism would be saying that we're not going to judge a person as committing a morally incorrect act when in reality Islam does teach that that act is morally incorrect. I'm sorry for side sidetracking. I just wanted to give a key example of how we're sometimes affected by the prominent and dominant worldviews in societies that we live in and we're not necessarily loyal to the worldview that we claim to follow. So worldviews are primarily concerned with the bigger questions which when dealt with actually shape how we act and think in regards to the smaller questions. A worldview is a very lens, prism, glasses that we use to understand and interpret and rationalize the world around ourselves and understand our experiences. So allow me to give you a very clear cut and key analogy. If I, as a particular person that follows the original Islam, the Islam brought by the Prophet Muhammad and the purified progeny of the Prophet Muhammad have an experience in which I have a crazy phenomenon of deja vu. That is to say, the experience that I have been in this situation before. I, as a Shia, will interpret this in light of the doctrine of Alam of Var. That is to say, that there was a realm, the realm in which we pre existed in, in which Allah asked us, Am I not your Lord? Is the Prophet Muhammad not your Prophet? And asked us about the Walaa. Because we have a doctrine in which we believe that there was an experience in that world, I can now take this experience of deja vu and connect it to that, and it makes sense of that experience I've had. Likewise, someone that claims to be a Hindu may take that experience and say, well, this is clear-cut proof of reincarnation. Now, I'm not saying that these are sophisticated explanations for that experience. I'm just giving an analogy and an example at the time being. Or, for example, someone who believes in Christianity, particularly Roman Catholicism, where part of my family is from, from the Philippines. When they see this action of self-flagellation or the crucifixion, in which people will crucify themselves to crosses, I might look at that and say, wow, they're able to do this because they have really strong conviction and psychological belief in this event. Whereas a Roman Catholic might say that, look, they're only able to do this because it's the true faith and their miraculous experience saves them from any harm. So there's different ways to interpret all these different facts. A particular case that is given today is of course the concept of a miracle. Most of the religions believe that there are certain cases of divine intervention or what we would say is an action which breaks the natural laws and is created and carried out by God as a means of liberating his prophets or demonstrating that his prophets and his guides are truly sent by him. We would take those examples and we would say that, wow, this is an excellent proof of our religion. Whereas an atheist who doesn't believe that there is such a thing as supernatural, no matter what evidence you bring him of miracle claims, no matter how many people you bring him who are healed here at the very holy shrine of our master, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, alayhi salam, he would just go ahead and say that, well, there's going to be a natural explanation for it because at the end of the day, that's what his worldview is. It's a naturalistic worldview which doesn't allow for explanations which fall outside the realm of the natural. By natural, of course, I mean that which can be seen by the five senses and empirically studied. So everyone, they shape their beliefs according to their very worldview. 
when someone who is homeless and asks for charity comes to us, of course, our particular worldview is going to shape how we engage with such a person. So it affects our thoughts, our experiences, and certainly our behavior. So every religion and sect in the world falls under a particular worldview. Most cultures also teach people to think in a particular worldview too. And what I mean by that is you may be in a country where you follow a religion which is not the dominant worldview of that society. Be it, for example, a Muslim in Tibet. But I guarantee you, whichever worldview influences Tibet the most, be it Tibetan Buddhism, is most likely going to have had some beliefs which crept into your worldview as a Muslim. Because society does always nonetheless affect people and their particular belief sets. So every culture happens to teach people to think in a particular worldview too. And we as Muslims in the West need to be very clear that that happens to us. And I, of course, am included in that, but nonetheless, we're trying to make a point for trying to understand the point of this entire discussion, inshallah ta'ala. Discussing under the broad range of worldviews allows us to do the following. Number one, make useful comparisons between reasonable beliefs and absurd ones. Number two, make meaningful conversations with others by asking big questions and understanding worldviews without reading libraries of books and books on understanding the tiny and intricate details of those individual worldviews. It allows us to have constructive conversations and make headway in tabligh and in da'wah without asking 500 questions because you'll learn what questions to ask by studying the nature of a worldview. It allows us to reject methodologies and beliefs because of the bigger picture, as opposed to just saying, well, let me analyze this tiny isolated belief. Sometimes you have a tiny isolated belief that makes no sense. That is to say that we don't have enough evidence to prove this according to our rationality. But nonetheless, the wider picture makes sense, and therefore you would accept that one belief. And other times you will have that one belief that makes a lot of sense, but then the wider picture is completely detestable by the intellect, and so we'd have to throw that out. It allows us to also make reasoned evaluations of the different worldviews, and it allows us to protect ourselves and our children from what we could describe as absolute foolishness. And I use that word foolishness not in a way in which I'm insulting those who engage in such debates and discussions over minor issues. But rather, I, I literally do believe that this is an act of foolishness in the sense that it wastes a lot of time and it gets nobody anywhere. And I fully admit that I say that as someone that used to engage in such discussions frequently. So when we look at these worldviews, questions we would ask ourselves are, number one, is there a God? What is the nature of that God? How does that God relate to the universe? How does God relate to human beings? And how does God relate to me personally? Then we would ask about the nature of man. We would ask, what is man? Is he, by is he by nature good or evil? Bit of both, perhaps. What's the future of man? And how should we care about other human beings? Well, one of the most important things when it comes to the nature of a worldview is the concept of knowledge. We would firstly ask, what can we know about the world around us? What can we know about Allah Azza wa Jal? How do we know what we know? That is to say, what are the sources of the knowledge we have? Are there limits to our knowledge? Can we trust our rationality? And can we increase in our knowledge? And it's this particular point that I want to focus on. I think it's probably the most important point that all Muslims, all Shias, and indeed all human beings need to ask themselves when analyzing their beliefs. We're trying to go back to the basics. And I think this is the most basic foundational question. Can we trust our rationality? Can we trust our intellects? And this goes back to that analogy I gave shortly before entering the discussion of a worldview. What do I mean by can we trust our rationality? As many of you will know, I'm certainly from a non-Muslim background, and I'm certainly from a non-Shia background in terms of parental ancestry. 
But when it comes to these particular questions, these were questions I investigated as a young teenager. And certainly there were certain questions I had which led me along the path to discovering this blessed original Islam, the Islam of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhum salam. Some of the questions I asked were as follows. Where am I heading in life? And is there a goal to all of this? Now, of course, these questions I asked were heavily premised upon the fact that I trusted in my reasoning abilities. And indeed, it was my reasoning abilities that allowed me to come outside of a box that I was born into, that environment that I was raised into. Because it allowed me to question certain key, bigger questions. That comes back to the concept of a worldview, right? Where we have the bigger questions that we question. We don't question silly little questions like, in which year was this particular edition of the Bible translated? And was it translated from the Latin or the French? That's irrelevant to me. A bigger question would be, what is the nature of revelation according to Roman Catholicism? Can I trust that model of revelation? Does the history of the Bible seem to align with that model of revelation that they claim? These are the bigger questions, not smaller little tiny details. And alhamdulillah, in asking for bigger questions, I was able to come to an understanding of the truth. When it comes to the intellect, thank God, alhamdulillah, the school of the Ahlul Bayt, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all, is certainly the school which gives a predominant and primary scope to the ability to trust our intellects. As for others, then inshallah ta'ala we'll be going through that over the next few nights. But I want you to ask yourselves all this question. If we are to engage in dialogue with anyone, what would we need to believe about the intellect in order to engage in successful and fruitful dialogue? One of the things that certainly attracted me to the concept of theism and to the concept of rejecting atheism entirely was a great argument formulated by one of the 20th century philosophers and a Christian literature writer, but nonetheless a truly brilliant rational argument. He states in his book, Naturalism, or Miracles rather, if a strict materialist refutes itself for the reason given long ago by Professor Haldane, and he quotes Professor Haldane as saying, if my mental processes are determined wholly and entirely by the motions of atoms in my brain. That is just to say that all that goes on in my brain according to the naturalist, the naturalist atheist, is that atoms move in my brain. I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. That is to say, if it was all physical and I had no choice in any of this, and that everything was just a physical motion creating a belief, I would have no reason believe it's to believe it's true. And hence, I have no reason for supporting my brain to be composed of atoms. C.S. Lewis correctly points out that if your belief is that we cannot trust the intellect, then even engaging in believing such a thing requires the intellect. So either you should switch off your intellect and hold that belief. But in doing so, you'd basically be saying, don't trust me because you can't trust my intellect. Or you should acknowledge that this belief itself is fallacious. Back to the analogy of the man I gave in most of the major cities who comes out and says we're all in the matrix, it's all a delusion. Can we trust such individuals who come out and say that reality as we experience it daily, that our very minds, that our very intellects cannot be trusted? This is the major question that I want us all to ponder over tonight. Does it make sense to believe in a set of doctrines, a set of doctrines which you have shaped scrutinized, come up to, by using your human mind, by using this God-given ability which Allah Azzawajal has shaped us all with, this ability to trust our minds. Does it make any sense to take that God-given gift of rationality and therefore start believing in things where you are told that you must switch off your rationality? That you are told that your rationality is not only something limited, but rather is something that will misguide you. Inshallah ta'ala, I know that one of the things that will be raised is to say that our rationality is subjective. But inshallah ta'ala, we'll discuss that more in the next few nights. Dear viewers, thank you once more for joining me live here in the holy city of Karbala.
please do not forget us in your du'as and likewise we will not forget you in our du'as here by the shrine of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.